incredible weekend. I want to I want to conclude our series, the cone of uncertainty. Anybody got your heart open, ready to receive a word from God today? And I want to. We've been talking about the cone of uncertainty, about looking out at the future and imagining and and, and believing where our year will go in 2020. About about the timing of God, about finding trust in the timing of God, waiting on God. And I began a message last weekend that I, I promised you we would take a break and that we would finish it this weekend. And I, I want to bring it to a completion today. And I want to talk about that idea of us being together, the people of God. And started a message last weekend called We've Got a Portion. And how many of you know that you do have a portion in God, that there is a portion for your life and that we've got a portion. And I, I want to begin our time together today by reading several different portions of the Bible, sections of the Bible. Normally, when we begin a message, we just read a, a verse or one section of the Bible. I want to read a lot of Bible today. Is it okay if I read a lot of Bible to get our time going? If you're violently opposed to the reading of the Word of God, you may want to check your heart a little bit. Get in a freedom group is what you need. Uh, but... I want, to, I want to read the verse we read last weekend, and I'm going to read several others just, just to give us clarity in our minds of what the Bible is talking about when it talks about God being our portion. This is Jeremiah, Lamentations 3, 21 through 26. But this I call to mind. Therefore, I have hope. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They're new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. Jeremiah is about to make a declaration from himself to himself. He's about to say something to himself. He says, the Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore, I will hope in him. The Lord is good to those who wait for him, to the soul who seeks him. It is good that one should wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord. David says it this way in Psalm 16, five through six. He said, the Lord is my chosen portion and my cup. You hold my lot. The lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. Indeed, I have a beautiful inheritance. This is God speaking to a priest named Aaron. And the Lord said to Aaron, you shall have no inheritance in their land. Numbers 18 and 20. You shall have no inheritance in their land. Neither shall you have any portion among them. I am your portion and your inheritance among the people of Israel. And this is God speaking to a man named Abram in Genesis 15 and 1. After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision saying, do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield and I am your exceedingly great reward. Every one of these verses is, is a promise that lets us know that we have a portion and God is in our future. That, that we have a portion and David Psalm 16 said, God is my portion. David was, was the youngest of eight brothers, which meant in, in his day, in his time, the oldest brother got the largest share of the inheritance, and then everybody else got the rest that was left over. So if you were the oldest, you got a lot. If you were number eight in line, you didn't get a whole lot from your dad. Your brother got the house. You got the house shoes. He got the closet, you got the t-shirt that your dad didn't wear. He, he, didn't, he, he didn't have a lot coming to him through an earthly inheritance. And David said, that's all right. My, my, my earthly dad may not be able to bring good things into my life, but I've got a heavenly father that is my cup and my portion. And the lines of my life aren't falling in a confined space. The lines of my life are going to fall in pleasant places. God is the one that holds my future. God spoke to Abram. Abram was, was afraid. That's why he said, don't be afraid. Because Abram had picked a fight with a bunch of kings. Now, he was just a man with a family, and, and he had a tribe, a, 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 a group of people that went with him. But, but he wasn't a nation. He didn't have an army. And he had, he had picked a fight in the name of the Lord and was living in fear. And God stepped in and said, don't be afraid, Abram. You may not have many shields in your family, but I, I, I'm going to be your shield. And he had just passed. Abram had just passed on 
an opportunity to receive a reward from an earthly king. An earthly king was going to bless him in a major way. I'm talking about significant, like life-changing wealth. And Abram said, no, I'm not going to receive it because if I receive it, you're going to say that I made Abram great. And you're not the one that's going to make me great. God's the one that's going to make me great. And he passed on it. And God stepped in and said, you didn't take that reward. So I'm going to be your exceedingly great reward. And when you're waiting on God, you need to remember that sometimes you're passing on earthly opportunities and you're passing on some things because you're not wanting what life can hand you. You're wanting what God wants to bring into your life. And while you're waiting for a significant relationship, sometimes it's not that you don't have opportunities. There's plenty of opportunities. It's just those people that are sliding into your DMs aren't the opportunity that God has for your life. Those aren't the people God wants to connect you with. And when you pass on that, you need to know you've got a better inheritance. And, and I love our church because we get to reach people who don't go to church and don't have a religious background. And some of them had ways of making money that maybe weren't quite legit. And to follow Jesus meant walking away from one source of income, and maybe for a moment it was a lessening of their income, but when they stopped getting money in a, in a way that wasn't God-honoring, and they stepped into a way that is God-honoring, God says, you passed on that reward, so guess what? I'm the reward that's in your future, that there's greater things in store. That when we pass on things, and we wait, we wait, God is in our future. God is your reward. God spoke to, to a man named Aaron, and when he's speaking to Aaron, he's speaking to a, an entire tribe of Israel known as the Levites. There were, there were 12 tribes of Israel, and he, and he speaks to the Levites through Aaron and says, you're not going to get an inheritance in the land. God had promised the nation of Israel that, that they would have physical land. It's where... Uh, the modern day Israel is today is I'm going to give you that. I'm going to give you that land. And he gave 11 tribes an allotment of land and they could have everything that was in the land. If there was a city there, they could have the city. If there was a house there, they could have the houses. They could have the fields, the, the vineyards, the wells, all of the resources of the land they could have. And then he came to the Levites and said, you, you don't get you don't get a portion of land. And it kind of sounds like a bad deal. But the reality is, is that the Levites still got cities. You go back and read the Bible. They still got cities. They still got houses. They still got clothes. The Levites actually had the best clothes of all the tribes of Israel. They, they had artists and designers create these amazing robes for them. And they had some serious bling going on in their life as they served the Lord. They still got spouses. They still got families. They still got money. They still got finances. The only difference is it didn't come from the world. It came from the hand of God because he said, you're my people and I take care of my people. And when we look at today in our lives, what we connect with isn't the other 11 tribes because God didn't want to have people whose inheritance was only in this world. God wanted a God wanted a kingdom of servant leaders. And when you talk about the New Testament, we are now kings and priests in God's house and God takes care of his people. So just because you don't have an earthly inheritance doesn't mean you don't have a heavenly inheritance. It may not come from the world, but it will come from the hand of God because God takes care of his people. And, and he wanted them to realize something that I'm calling you to be a holy people. I'm calling you to be a special people. I'm calling you to be a people who are called out. And I think sometimes when, when we come into a moment like this, whether it's because of comparison and uh, we're comparing our lives to what other people have, which, which, by the way, is always a terrible idea, always. Never goes well to do comparison. We come in feeling like we don't have anything, that God hasn't been good to us. We come in thinking that nothing significant is happening in our lives. And I want to tell you, you need to just take a minute. And this is going to be awkward because some of you only want to stare this direction, but some of you just need to gaze around this room and you need to look at this room that's filled from the front row to the back row and filled from side to side and realize God's already given you a portion that you are a part of the people of God today. And there are people in this room who will love you. There are people in this room who will support you. There are people in this room who will encourage you. 
who will believe the best for you. When you're going through something, they will pray with you. When you're walking through hardships, they'll cry with you. When you're celebrating on the mountaintop, they'll shout and rejoice with you. And when you don't have encouragement, they'll lift you up. And when you get tired, there's people that will come alongside you and hold your hands up. Listen, we've already got a portion. We are the church of Jesus Christ. We are the people of God. We are a chosen generation. We are a holy nation. We are a peculiar people. We're God's people on the earth today. And we've got a portion. And it's sitting in this room right now. What an incredible thing it is to be a part of the church of Jesus Christ. To be a part of God's great house. And to know that God takes care of his people. That God takes care of his special people. And and one of the ways that God uh, referred to himself in the Old Testament, if you've been around church a little bit, you may have heard this. It was a, it was a, a title, El Shaddai, an old Hebrew phrase. It comes out of the Old Testament. And, and it literally just means the all-sufficient one. And a way to understand the all-sufficient all one is whatever need that is that you could ever have in your life, God is already the answer. He's, he's already the solution. In fact, The way that he describes himself is God doesn't describe himself as a rewarder. Let's don't make the mistake. He didn't say he was a rewarder. He said he was an exceedingly great rewarder. I don't know how many times I've said this phrase, but hopefully one more time won't hurt. He's not the God of just enough. He's the God of more than enough. (laughs) We get into a scarcity mindset thinking that God is going to barely be enough. No, 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 no. God never barely met a need. Whenever he meets a need, everybody gets bread and there's 12 baskets left over. Whenever God meets a need, everybody gets bread and there's seven baskets left over. Whenever you have a need, he doesn't just fill one vessel. He fills every vessel in the house. God never barely met a need. God met a need exponentially and greater than you can imagine because he's not the God of enough. He's the God of more than enough. That he's the God of increase and abundance. El Shaddai means God is in your future, and when you have a need, God is already the solution. And I I think sometimes when you're waiting on God, like we're talking about in this series, in this collection of talks, that I think sometimes we can we can talk ourselves out of the portion that God wants for our lives with the wrong narrative. It's possible to talk yourself out of what God's trying to talk you into. If you don't get the right narrative, because it's hard, it's hard to go to the right place with the wrong narrative. God, God is exceeding. God is abundant. God is more than you can handle. For some of us, we're, we're living in more than we realize right now. Can I, can I just tell you that your inheritance is very great? Your, your portion is abundant. It's incredible. And sometimes it's the grace of God that that he doesn't move on our calendar. Sometimes it's the grace of God that he only does the right thing at the exact right time. Because if God did everything that he was going to do in your life all at once, it would crush you. It it would be more than you can contain. In fact, that's the promise of the word of God is prove me in, in this and see if I won't open the windows of heaven and pour out more than you have room to handle. But just because he's going to pour it out doesn't mean he's going to bring it all at once. That he's going to do it all at once. In fact, when, when God moved in Israel and, and brought them a, a nation that had no land and brought them into their portion of the earth, they had waited for more than 40 years when God, when there was finally people who would believe God, who would trust God, who would take the steps to move forward. It's been more than 40 years. And so you would think that After more than 40 years of waiting, God would just give them the totality of the land. But that's not that's not how God did it. In fact, Deuteronomy 7 records the instructions of how God told them to move into their portion. And it's our instructions today to move into our inheritance. God said in Deuteronomy 7, 17. He said, if you say in your heart, these nations are greater than I, how can I dispossess them? Let's put it in context. God is saying, don't do this. He's saying, don't say in your heart, these nations are greater than I. Don't question in your heart, how can I dispossess them? And instead, he gives them better instructions. It begins in verse 21. He says, you shall not be in dread of them, for the Lord your God is in your midst, a great and awesome God. Watch this. 
The Lord your God will clear away these nations before you little by little. You may not make an end of them all at once, lest the wild beasts grow too numerous for you. What I'm going to bring into your life, you can't handle if I do it all at once. But the Lord your God will give them over to you and throw them into great confusion until they are destroyed. And he will give their kings into your hands. And you shall, you shall make their name, watch this, perish from under heaven. No one will be able to stand against you until you have destroyed them. I want you to notice what he deals with first. He said, if you say in your heart. Every one of us has an internal narrative in our life. He said, if you say in your heart, he's cautioning them about the internal narrative that they have in their minds because the wrong narrative will take you in the wrong direction. I was, I was traveling a few years ago and I was in a, a major metro area and uh, the this, this story doesn't end well, so I'm not going to tell you what city I was in because I don't want to front it out, but I, I, was, I was wanting to catch a train, a, a, a subway from where I was and, and go to an area that... If I mentioned it, you would know exactly where I'm talking about because it's been in TV shows, it's been in movies, you've, you've all seen it. I'd never been there, I wanted to see it. And, uh, and I, I don't know if you've noticed this or not, but we live in an area where we don't do a whole lot of commuter trains and subways, you know. It's not, not how we get around in Southwest Florida. And so I, I was struggling, but I, I, I am like reasonably intelligent. And so I, I figured out the train that I needed to get on to get from where I was to the sightseeing place I wanted to go. And, and then a phone call came in while I was waiting on the train to get there. So I probably not a lot of wisdom in taking the phone call, but I get, I get engaged to talking to somebody. A, a train pulls up, doors open. I just jump on the train with everybody else and uh, doors shut. I sit down and immediately the train takes off and I know that I have made an enormous mistake <laughs> because I felt the direction I, I should be going that way into my promised land <laughs> and the train goes the other way and when the doors open I realized that the lines of my life had not fallen in pleasant places <laughs> that I was in a part of town that you've also seen in movies <laughs> but for the opposite reason known for for violence and high crime and I, I, I get out, I'll never forget looking up and there was 19 minutes till the next train. I, I got my prayer life so in order over those 19 <laughs> minutes. I, I touched the throne room of God. But come on, how many times have we jumped on a narrative that everybody else jumps on? How many times have we jumped on a narrative about what's going on in the world and we jumped on the culture narrative that's not taking us into the promise that God has for us in fact, it's taking us to a place that we don't want to go. And I, I think sometimes there's churches that get on a narrative that we're living in a doomsday and that there's darkness in the world. Listen, let's be a church that believes that light conquers darkness and that we're here to take over in the name of Jesus Christ. I think maybe there's people sitting in the room today that you're jumping on a narrative that there's nothing ahead of us and that only the worst is ahead of us. Let's get off of that train and let's get on the train that's going to move us into the promises and purposes of God in our life. Because the wrong narrative will take you to the wrong place. And the right narrative will take you to the right place. That's why God said, I want to deal with what you're saying in your heart. And he gives them instructions. And I want to give us four declarations today. That if you're, you're waiting on God and you're believing that God is your portion. You're wondering where your life is going to go in 2020. I want to give you four declarations that come out of God's instructions to the nation of Israel to move into their promised land. The first one is this, and I, I make daily declarations every day. I want to encourage you to make it a practice in your life. The first one is this, I'm here, but I'm getting there. God brought them into the land. When he speaks this to them, they're, they're in the land, but the entirety of the land wasn't theirs yet. They, they didn't have all of it, but they did have a portion. And he said, I'm going to give it to you little by little, which meant they got a small part of what God had already given them. And then over time, watch this, God was going to bring fulfillment of his promises. 
that fulfillment was coming, but it was gonna happen little by little. And somebody in the room needs to realize this, is you don't need to overlook where you are right now. One of the best pieces of advice an older pastor ever gave me because he knew me and he knew that I had a lot of vision and I had a lot of ambition and I wanted to do great things for God. And he was like, that's great, but don't forget to stop and celebrate where you are right now sometimes. Because if you're not careful, you'll constantly live frustrated about where you wanna go and you'll forget that God's already doing some pretty great stuff in your life right now. And if you're not careful, yeah, come on. If you're not careful, if you're not careful, you'll live in the frustration of unfulfillment and forget that God's already fulfilled a whole lot of things in your life right now. And some of us need to realize like we're looking out 2020, 2021, and we're wanting to see some fulfillment. Listen, you're not waiting for your life to begin. Your life has already begun and God's goodness is here right now. And if you don't have anything else, you got breath in your body. You've got potential in your life. You've got the word of God. You've got a church full of people sitting around in this room, believing God's best for your life, that God's already extended his grace and his mercy in your life, which means you've now got eternal life. You're not waiting for eternal life to begin. You're living eternal life right now that we're stepping. We're not waiting that we're in the abundance right now. I'm living in it. I may not have seen the fulfillment of it, but I'm in the abundance of God's life for me right here, right now. But he didn't just stop there. He said, don't settle there. Don't settle in that place. Say, I'm here, but I'm getting there. Because what God gives his people is a moving forward mentality. That little by little, I'm here, but I'm getting there. That God is doing something greater in my life. That I'm here, but I'm going there. I can't think of a better time to have lived than when Jesus was on the earth. To, to, be, to be there, to see Jesus in physical form, to see him open blind eyes, to see him raise the lame, to see him unstop deaf ears, to see him stop and interrupt. I read this one this week. To stop and interrupt a funeral procession and raise the dead guy back to life. How incredible would that have been? But Jesus said, I'm here, but I'm not staying here because I'm gonna create a church and I've done great works, but greater things shall you do also. Come on, let's make this our declaration. I'm here, I'm living in the abundance of God. I'm in my promised land. I'm here, but I'm getting there. I'm gonna see the fulfillment that God has for my life. Here's the second declaration that he gives them. I wanna give you this declaration for your life. I can handle it. I can handle it. God specifically told them the land is yours, but I'm leaving the kings in place. That when you read the book of Joshua, you, you find out the number that there were 31 kings that were left in the promised land. At least 31, at least 31 kings that they were going to have to fight to go into their portion. In other words, God tells them this. Adversity is in your future. But also, God is in your future. Adversity is there. He said, I'm going to leave them there, but the kings aren't there to defeat you. And they're not there to be left there. They're just there in that place until you get there. And I think sometimes when we're facing battles in our life, and, and, and no doubt 2020 will hold battles. No doubt there's adversity in every one of our futures. But the problem is is sometimes when we face adversity and we face problems, it feels like it's our lot in life. It, it, it feels like it's our inheritance. And it becomes part of our identity. When you go through seasons of lack, I, I've, I've walked through this. This isn't, this isn't what, what I think or an opinion. This is what I know, is that poverty becomes a part of your life. And, and you feel like it's your lot in life, that that's your assignment. And some of us are walking through unemployment, and we feel like joblessness and never being able to get ahead and just barely making it is our lot in life. Some of us are struggling with addiction, and we just feel like that's our identity, and that's our inheritance in this life, and, and that's just who we are. And, some of us are struggling with loneliness and it just feels like no significant relationships are, are coming into our life. And if you're not careful, adversity will feel like it's your portion. And God said, adversity is in your future, but it's not your portion. 
Victory is your portion. <laughs> because when you face the giant, when you face the king, I want you to know that I'm in your midst and they're already defeated before you get there. So don't go there and think that that's your assignment and you're supposed to live with it. I left it there so it can become part of your story that you overcame it. Because listen to me, poverty isn't your portion and joblessness isn't your portion and addiction isn't your portion and loneliness isn't your portion. Victory is your portion. And whenever it rises, I can't tell you how many times I've had to tell myself when adversity comes, if it's here, it's because God knows I can handle it and I'm not stopping and it's not going to stay a part of my life. And it may be in my portion, but it's not my portion because I can handle it in the name of the Lord. And there may be 31 kings, but 31 kings are going to fall in the name of Jesus because we are the people of God. And God is in our midst. Here's the third declaration that he gives them. Is I'm choosing confidence over comfort. He said, you've already got a small part of it. And you can stay there in your comfort. Or you can move with confidence into the future that I have for you. And we, we, we mistake confidence sometimes. Because we think confidence is supposed to feel good. And I've found in my life that rarely does confidence ever feel good. There was a time when I felt called to the ministry very early in my life. When I, when I first began to preach, I, I, I'm, a, I'm an extreme introvert. I, I've, I've dealt with uh, social anxiety all of my life. I, I've, I've struggled with anxiety and all kinds of things, and I realized very early on that my personality was going to work against my calling. And I made a promise to God when I was probably about twenty or twenty-one, was that I knew that I wanted to—I knew that I wanted to preach the word of God, but I knew that there were a lot of environments that my personality wouldn't wouldn't jive with what God was calling me to do. And so I just made a—I made a decision that I would get out of my comfort zone, and I would walk in confidence in the calling that God had for me. And listen to me, it's never been comfortable because I'm not called to have confidence in myself. I'm called to have confidence in God. And some of us, some of us are staying in a small place because it's comfortable. But God's calling you to step out of comfort and go with confidence into his calling. And this weekend is one of those weekends because we're launching groups. And it's easy to come and sit in a row and remain anonymous but today is God is calling you to leave comfort and get in circles and let somebody know your name and go with confidence, believing that when I get around the right people and I get the right narrative, God's going to take me to the right place in my life. And this weekend is baptism weekend. And listen, it's so easy. Like we, we stopped doing this, but we used to do everybody bow your heads and close your eyes and we'll let you pray privately. We just stopped doing all of that stuff because we're making a public declaration in Jesus but sometimes it's easy to stand in a group like this and have a private moment with Jesus. But this weekend is baptism weekend and you don't need to stay in the moment of a private place. Today, you need to step out with confidence and go forward in your faith in the waters of baptism and know that God is in your future. And I wonder sometimes how many people stay in dead end jobs. Stuck in a job that's not providing for them, not fulfilling them. It doesn't fit them. And they're in a small place, but it's comfortable. And they never step out of comfort and go with confidence into something new. And can I just tell you, that place is too small for you because God's got a greater inheritance in your life. And today, we just need to make some decisions that wherever we are, I'm not going to choose comfort. Today, I'm choosing confidence in God to go into the portion that he has for my life. And here's the fourth one that he gives them. Is this. This is the fourth declaration. What's ahead of me is greater than what's behind me. What's ahead of me is greater than what's behind me. You know, the past is crystal clear. You can see the past very clearly. And the future is murky at best. And God said, I want you to realize that, that what's ahead of you is exponentially greater than what's behind you. Because, you've, because you can see the past so clearly it, it, it sometimes is easy to get, to get focused on where we've been and feel like there's nothing ahead of us. That's what the nation of Israel would do. 
is every time God would try to move them into their future and move them into their portion, they would create the wrong narrative because they would look back to their past. Like God was trying to bring them into the promised land and they wanted to go back to Egypt because they had onions in Egypt. Can I tell you, if onions is the vision for your life, you're in serious trouble. Like, good Lord, we just finished 21 days of prayer and fasting and I never wanna see a vegetable again in my life. I don't, like and some of us are looking back at onions thinking that was the best that God had for us and God said, no, 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 no. I know you can see that clearly, but there's something ahead of you that you can't see that is exponentially greater than what you do see and that's why the word of God says this, as is it written, what no eye has seen and no ear heard and it's not entered into the heart of man. You can't even imagine it. What God has prepared for those who love him. I just want to declare it over your life today. You've got a portion that God is in your future that I don't know what 2020 holds. There may be adversity, but whatever adversity you face, it is not there to defeat you. It's there to give you a legacy of being an overcomer, that you are more than a conqueror through Christ Jesus, that victory is your portion, that addiction may rise, but addiction is going to fall, that poverty may come, but it's not going to stand in the name of the Lord. And little by little, I'm moving in to the fulfillment of what God has promised me. And when it comes, I can hand it, that greater things are in store for my life, that I'm choosing confidence over comfort, and what's behind me is nothing compared to what's ahead of me. Come on. identity that comes from the world it's whatever that you whatever possessions you have in your life that all that all you have is a is an earthly inheritance and today I want to I want to pray a prayer for people who want to let go of an earthly inheritance and receive a heavenly inheritance and the Word of God tells us that all of our inheritance is found in one place and it's a person named Jesus Christ that everything that God is going to do in our lives comes through a relationship with Jesus Christ. That's why it says, neither is there salvation in any other name except the name of Jesus. Today, today maybe all you have in your life is, is, is an earthly, a temporal inheritance. Maybe it even feels a little bit comfortable. You know what? I'm going to encourage you to do something because I believe God's presence is in this place to draw people into something greater. And that is to let go of your earthly inheritance and through Christ receive 
a heavenly and an eternal inheritance. That today somebody's going to leave this room taking the first breaths of eternal life. Well, I'm going to lead us in that prayer. If you've never, if you've never received Christ, He is our portion. He is our inheritance. Everything that God's going to do in your life is going to come through a relationship with Jesus Christ. I also want to pray for a second group of people. It's people who at one point were part of the family of God. You had a, you had a heavenly father that was bringing good things into your life. And for whatever reason, it doesn't matter why, you let go of that inheritance to go back and grab an earthly inheritance. And here's what I want to tell you. It doesn't matter what you've done. It doesn't matter where you've been. Today, you can receive your heavenly inheritance again. And God's wanting to bring you back into his family. I'm going to lead us in a prayer. And I'm going to say the prayer out loud. I want you to repeat it after me. And part of your portion is standing in this room today. And every person in this room is going to pray this prayer with you as you take a step across the line of faith because there's a whole church family rooting you on as you go into the abundant life that Jesus brings. Come on, in this room today, let's pray this simple prayer. Let's begin relationship with Jesus Christ. Come on, say this. Say, Lord Jesus, I receive you now. Welcome to my world. Forgive me of my past. Wash away my sin. Make me a new person. Today I follow you. I commit to walk in your path to follow your way. I receive you now as my leader and my Lord. And I'll never be the same in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. Come on, can we give Jesus some praise in the room today? It's incredible. Listen. You just pray that prayer with me. We're going to make a declaration in this room that Jesus is Lord. If you just pray that prayer, say, Jason, when you were praying it, I was praying out of my heart. And today I began a relationship with Jesus or I recommitted my life to Jesus. I'm going to count to three just so you have a moment of confidence. But I want you to shoot your hand in the room today because our whole church family is going to celebrate this moment with you. You ready? Come on, on the count of three. This is your moment. One, two, if that was you, three, would you shoot your hand in the air and say, Jason, I prayed that prayer with you today. Today I made a new beginning, a fresh start with Jesus. Come on, I see those hands. It's incredible. Come on, let's welcome to the family of God.